let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a time of extensive worship. You deserve much more. You are worthy. You are worthy. I'll bless the Lord forever. I'll bless the Lord always. You are my God and King forever. I'll bless you. I'll worship you all my days. And Lord, as we go into your word this morning, we pray for insight, we pray for revelation, we pray for clarity, and we pray that, Lord, you would empower us to apply these words to our hearts and to our lives. And these words will transform us in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen. And you can shout a believing amen wherever you are. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So today we are looking at a question. We're going to be asking ourselves a question. Who has your devotion? Who has your devotion? The giver or the gift? Who has your devotion? The giver or the gift? Where does your loyalty lie? Where does it stand? Is it with the giver or is it with the gift? And we're going to take our text from Genesis 22, 1 to 14. Genesis 22, 1 to 14. Genesis 22, 1 to 14. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And it came to pass, after these things, praise the name of the Lord. I'll start again. And it came to pass, after these things, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there a bond, for a bond offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto his father, Abraham, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built there an altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and said, Here, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him in a ra him a ram caught in a ticket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering 
in the stead of his son. Verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is to this day. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Praise the name of the Lord. God is indeed absolutely awesome. When we started Sunday school this morning, the topic was how to overcome temptation. And we're told here, God tempted Abraham. Another word for tempted was test. You know, so it was a test that God uh, put before him. And in our Sunday school, we were reading the same reference. You know, so God definitely has a plan for us. And he wants us to go to pass the test of life, as it were. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, many of us have read this story over and over again. It's not a new text. You know, but I just want to pull out a few things that God has laid on my heart to emphasize on this morning. And one of the things that came to my mind as I was reading this story, I, I just wondered, has anyone ever wondered why it was Abraham? that was tested and not Sarah. Has anyone ever thought of it? Why is it Abraham? Why not Sarah? Why didn't God say to Sarah, okay, you're the one, take the, your son, the son you love, take him to this place I'm going to show you and then kill him there as a burnt offering. Why was it not Sarah? And I, I just have a few thoughts on this. So let's go to Genesis 16, 16. Genesis 16, 16. And the Bible says, and Abram was four score and six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. So Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar had Ishmael for him. I'm going somewhere with this. <clears throat> and then we move now on to Genesis 21 verse 5. Genesis 21 verse 5. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Abraham was 100 years old. So if you take the gap from when Ishmael was born up until the time Isaac was born, that makes 14 years. I'm going somewhere with this. Sarah stayed in a state of childlessness for an extra 14 years, whilst her husband's situation was different. She stayed in a state of childlessness for far longer than Abraham. 14 years is a really long time for Sarah, especially now when it has become really clear that the issue of infertility had nothing to do with Abraham and had something to do with her. So those 14 years would have been more agonizing for her. I call it 14 years of anguish and pain, not knowing if the promise of God for her will be fulfilled. 14 years of not knowing whether it is only Ishmael who is the son of her maid that will carry on the family in lineage. So Sarah had already been through her test. That's my point. So this final test had to be to Abraham. So if you like, you could say that Sarah had had a fair share of tests. 14 years extra that she's had to wait for the fulfillment of the promise. Praise the name of the Lord. Now let's look at Abraham. 14 years, in Abraham's case, he has grown used to being called daddy. Because Ishmael will see him and say, you know, maybe he will call him, hey, Ishmael, Ishmael. And say, yes, daddy. 14 years of maybe, you know, his neighbors calling him, Ishmael's dad, where are you? Maybe even family members, Ishmael's dad. So his title had changed. 14 years of maybe playing football. I can imagine if it was in our time now. Playing football. Or maybe going to the movies. You know, with Ishmael. So, Abraham and Sarah were definitely, definitely not in the same place. 
Abraham had had 14 years. Yes, he wasn't Sarah's son. He was the son of the Ishmael, but definitely he was Abraham's son. One that he really cherished. One, as far as he's concerned, brought that title barren from his life. I'm going somewhere with this. So maybe that explains why Abraham was the one that was put to the test. God was going to test his loyalty, his devotion. Is it to him or is it to the gift? And the gift can be anything. It could be a child, it could be a job, it could be anything. God was going to test it. Now, the truth of the fact is this, that the minute we turn our lives to Christ, we are automatically enrolled in this school called testing. Our devotion to God and our loyalty to God will be put to test. Guess what? God already knows the answer to the test. But he just wants you and I to know the answer to the test. Because if I say by show of hand, everybody put your hand up. If you have devotion to God, if you're loyal to God, of course, I'm going to put up my hands and my feet and I'm sure everybody on the platform would do so. But it is when the test happens that you and I will truly know where our devotion and our loyalty lies. Now, the examination is not designed to pass or fail the student. But it is designed to find out if the student got anything out of those lectures, those teachings, those tutorials, those excursions. You know, just imagine all the students on the platform. The exam is not designed to pass or fail a student. The lecturer wants to know whether the student has gained anything from all those years of lecturing, of teaching. And that's the purpose of the test. And my prayer for each one of us is, whenever we go through this test, we will come out successfully in the mighty name of Jesus. So we're going to go back to our text now. God had to set the stage. God was about to test Abraham. So God had to remove Ishmael from the scene. Ishmael had to misbehave. The Bible said Sarah saw him mocking Isaac. Ishmael had to misbehave. Ishmael had to get out of the way. Because the Bible told Abraham, Ishmael cannot stay in this house. Ishmael has to go. God is setting the stage to test Abraham. So Ishmael had to go. Ishmael had to misbehave. So maybe you're wondering, why are X, Y, Z things happening in my life? Maybe God is setting a stage for a test. My prayer is that we will not fail. We will succeed and we will come out shining in Jesus' mighty name. Abraham was very grieved. He was very reluctant. Of course, who would want to? I mean, he's grown used to having this boy now. Maybe perhaps now about 15 years. I'm not sure. You know, he's grown used to having Ishmael around, you know. And suddenly now God says he's got to go. So reluctantly, he sends Ishmael and his mother away. And how do I know he did it reluctantly? The Bible says when he sent them away, look at Genesis 21, the previous chapter. Genesis 21 verse 14. The Bible says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. You're sending a woman and a grown youth. Ishmael now is at least 15 years old. You're sending them away. In fact, it will be more than that. It would be a lot, a lot because Isaac was old enough to be playing in the field and, you know, and he was mocking him. So let's even say at least 15 years old. Abraham sends Hagar and this 15-year-old boy away with bread and a bottle of water. Do you know what I was thinking? The Bible doesn't say this, but I'm just thinking now. Maybe he's thinking, oh. They will go away with the bottle of water. They will go away with the bread. They will eat the bread, finish the bottle of water and come back. And maybe God will change his mind when he sees that, look, these people are destitute. You know, but he, Abraham did not know that God was setting the stage for his test. 
Because even though, yes, the water ran out, the food ran out, God provided for Hagar and Ishmael. And there was no reason for them to return back home to Abraham. Abraham was very reluctant. He was very, very reluctant. Maybe he thought God would change his mind. Ishmael would come back. But God said, no, 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 no. I really want to test you. This boy has to go. Praise the name of the Lord. And I want us to read another scripture. And I'll, 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 I'll say something on that. Genesis 17. Genesis 17. We're going to read verse 1. And then we're going to read 17 and 18. Genesis 17. We're starting with verse 1. And then we're going to jump to 17 and 18. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham. And said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now let's jump to verse 17. Then Abraham fell upon his face. You know, God had said a few things in between. Because of our time, we won't read that. You know, after God had said a few things about his covenant, what he was planning to do. Now look at Abraham's response. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. God had given both Sarah and Abraham a promise. God had said to Abraham when he was 99, you know, 90 years old and nine, 99 years old, that look, your wife, you're going to have a son. This promise is still going to be fulfilled. You know, the promise was made when he was 75. God said, look, walk before me and be perfect. This mistake has got to be gotten rid of. And then a year down the line, Abraham falls on his face and says, God, I, I don't think this thing you're talking about can happen again. This is so many years down the line, you know. And I, I already have a grown-up son, Ishmael. So let Ishmael live before you. Let's leave Sarah alone. Is she going to bear a child at 90? Lord, let's forget about this whole thing. That's why he had to go through the test. Because his focus was no longer on God now. His focus was on this thing, this alternative. So God had to get rid of the alternative in his life. Ishmael had to go. And Abraham had to be put to the test. Where was his devotion now? Is it on God now? Or is it on the gift? This child that has come. Where is his devotion? God had to test. Because he said, you know what? Let, let's, you know, Ishmael is before you. So Ishmael had to go. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, going back to our main text, God says, okay, I want you to take your son. I want you to take your holy son, the one that I know you love. I want you to take him and sacrifice him. So, going back to the previous text about Ishmael, after Ishmael had gone, I'm sure in in, I, in uh, Abraham's mind is thinking, okay, Isaac is at, at least still there, you know. So even though one son is gone, I have another son. So I'm backtracking again on myself now. I still have one son left. And God now says to him, this one too has to go. This one too has to go. And God was very clear in the description. Your son, your only son. The one that you love. He couldn't say it was Ishmael. Because Ish, remember, Ishmael had already left. God had already gotten rid of the alternative. So it was very clear what God was asking. It is Isaac. The one that you love. The one that has your devotion. The one where your heart is now in. Because Ishmael is gone. Previously your devotion was on that one. So that one is gone. Now it's on this one. So this one too. Let me take this one from you. And let's see where your devotion is going to be. And God said to him, go to the land of Moriah. You know, as I was reading the references, incidentally, 
you know, Solomon built a house for the Lord on the mount in Moriah as well. Interesting. And it was in that same place that God said, take Isaac. Now, the interesting thing about Moriah was that it was three days journey, at least three days journey away. At least three days journey away. Praise the name of the Lord. At least three days journey away. That was how far away Moriah was. Now, just imagine, you know, God is very interesting. Just imagine Abraham's thought as he journeyed along. What will people say when they hear this barbaric thing I am about to do? What will Sarah say? I am very sure. Ladies in the house, just imagine your husband wakes up in the morning and says, God says, I should go and, we should go and kill our son. I'm sure Sarah did not know. So, and just imagining that as he was journeying along, he was thinking, what will Sarah say? Will God change his mind? He's thinking, what about the promise? God promised that he was going to do something, you know, to Sarah. Now Ishmael was gone and now this is the only child we have left. Is God going to change his mind? What about the promise? Okay, let's even assume that God does allow this boy to die. Will Sarah get pregnant again? I'm sure these were things that were going through his mind. Or maybe, will Ishmael return back home? These thoughts were playing in his mind. They were playing in his mind as it was journey. And it was three days. You know, God, I believe personally that God allowed that space of time to give an Abraham an opportunity to change his mind. Maybe he wasn't going to go ahead with this. Maybe he was going to change his mind. So you may be wondering, why is the test prolonged? Because God really wants to know whether you are still going to stick to your guns. Praise the name of the Lord. And God said, give him as a burnt offering. When you say burnt, there's only one meaning of burnt. Burn. Anything you burn is not alive. I'm sure you know that. If it is burnt, then that thing is dead. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. When, when God said to Abraham, give it as a burnt offering, there was only one thing. It, Isaac was going to have to be killed. You know, but thank God, um, God is a faithful God. Um, one thing, if there's one thing that's really clear from all of this is the fact that um, Abraham definitely knew he heard from God. So it wasn't like the devil was playing games with his mind. He knew that he definitely heard from God. Now, I, I want us to, I want to point out to us one of the things, um, what Abraham said during this journey, what he said as he was journeying along. And it's important what we say when we are going through that test is important what we say now let's look at um um, Ab um genesis 22 5 genesis 22 5 whilst we don't know what abraham was thinking you know i was giving some suppositions earlier about what abraham could possibly be thinking about whilst we don't definitely know what he was thinking we know what he definitely said so let's look at genesis 22 25 and abraham said unto his young men abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come to you again. That's a very prophetic statement. He said, we're going to go and worship and then we're going to come back to you again. We are going to worship and we will return. Now let's look at Genesis 22 verse 8. If we move down to verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. God said, you know, Abraham said, God will provide a, a, a lamb for the burnt offering. When, when Isaac asked him, Dad, we have wood, we have fire, we have a knife, but where is the burnt offering? We have all these things. Where is the burnt offering? Praise the name of the Lord. Where is the burnt offering? And Abraham said, let's look at Genesis 22, 13 and 19. When you're going through the test, what you say matters. What you say matters a great deal. Genesis 22 and then 13 and 19. Okay. 13 says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a ticket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. 
Abraham had said earlier, God will provide. And guess what? God provided. He said, God will provide. And God provided. You know, you and I can say God will provide now because we, we know the story of Abraham. But at the time this was happening, Abraham did not know. For sure. But he said God will provide. That was his prophetic statement. And then drop to verse 19. So Abraham returned unto his young men. And they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. When he was leaving the young man, he said, look, we're going to go and we're going to return back to you. And that was exactly what happened. They did return. So even when you're going to the test, watch what you say. Because it could become a prophecy. If it's a prophetic word, speak what you want. Don't speak what you think is going on. Speak what you want. Speak what you want. Change your language. Change your confession. Say what you want. Say it. Don't say, I'm sick, I'm dying. Uh -uh. Is that what you want? No. I am healed. I don't care what the reports say. I'm healed in Jesus' name. I'm coming out of this mess. I'm reaching the name of Jesus. Say what you want. Even though you're going through that test, say what you want. And then the other thing I wanted to also pull out. Don't develop an undue devotion or affection to the gift. You could see that clearly in the case of Abraham, particularly with him and Ishmael, his first son. Please don't develop an undue devotion or, or, or yeah, that's the word, devotion to the gift. The devotion must always be exclusively reserved for the giver. And the giver in this case is God. But thank God, I believe that in the case of Isaac, Abraham had learned a lesson. Maybe before his devotion was, or his, if you like, his attention was divided between Ishmael and, and, and God. But now he had learned a lesson and was willing to let go. And thank God he did. Because this time around, he did not choose the gift, but he chose the giver. His preference was not for the gift, his son. He was willing to let go of his son so he could have the giver. And thank God, aren't we glad he did? You know, and this reminds me of the story of Daniel. You know, let's backtrack a little bit to the story of Daniel. Daniel 6 3. Daniel 6 3. There was so much at stake for Daniel when they said, there was a decree out there, don't pray to another God, you know. I think it was in the space of 30 days or so. Don't pray to another God, let's just pray to, to this image erected. Nobody should make any prayers to any God. There was so much at stake. What was at stake for Daniel? Let's see. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was found in him. And the king thought to set him over the realm. That was at stake for him. And for many people, that thing, the promotion, wow. A foreign, you know, you are a, a, a foreigner in this strange place, you know. And the king is going to set you over the whole realm. Just one little compromise. Just one little, it's only a little thing. I mean, after I can still pray to God. I just have to just close my curtains. You know, I can just mumble the prayers. I don't have to say it out loud. No one needs to really hear me when I'm saying it out loud. There was a lot at stake for him. But what did Daniel do? Daniel 6.10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being opened in his chambers towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. This was his lifestyle. It wasn't something that he was doing 
you know, just to show off that, you know, I can, I can, I can rebel against the king. No, the Bible said as he did normally, as was his custom, opened the window, knelt down three times a day, prayed, and all could see him. Praise the name of the Lord. He chose the giver and not the gift. I'm going somewhere with this. Now, incidentally, if you look at the word giver gift, they almost like sound alike. And we may easily be led to believe that a we have a relationship with the giver when we have the gift. Please don't be led to believe that. The fact that you have a gift is not an indication that you have a sound relationship with the giver. And I'm going to read a text for us. Romans 11, 29. Romans 11, 29. It says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And I also want to read it in the Passion Translation. But I'm going to add verse 28 to it. So I'll be reading Romans 11, 28 to 29 in the Passion Translation. And it says, Now, many of the Jews are opposed to the gospel, but their opposition has opened the door of the gospel to you who are not Jewish. Yet, they are still greatly loved by God because their ancestors, ancestors were divinely chosen to be his. And when God chooses someone and graciously impacts gift to him, they are never rescinded. So the gifts are without repentance. In other words, the gift will not be revoked. So it is possible for someone to have a broken relationship with the giver and the gift is still in place. So please don't ever be deceived that, oh, because the gift is still in manifestation, I have a sound relationship with the giver. Very, very important. Now, when we choose the giver, we get much more than we thought we were losing. So let's look at Abraham, for instance. Abraham was losing his son. As far as this concerned, Isaac was already dead. But guess what? Isaac was reserved and Abraham found an exchange ram in the ticket. So Abraham lost nothing. In fact, if anything, he got much more. He got much more out of this whole thing. And if you look at Daniel... Daniel too got much more out of it. Let's read the account of Daniel. But even before we read the account of Daniel, guess what? I, I had a question. You know the ram that was caught in the ticket? When was that ram placed there? Was it just in, you know, immediately placed there as soon as, you know, Abraham picked up the knife? Is that the case? Is that when it, was, when it happened? No. The ram had always been there. But he only took Abraham's obedience for his eyes to be opened to see that ram that was already there. So God is just waiting, if you like, for you to take that step. And he will show you the provision, the alternative provision he has made available. Let's read also the account of Daniel. What happened to Daniel after he passed the test. Daniel 6, 25 to 28. Daniel 6, 25 to 28. And I'm almost wrapping up. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom for that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and he walketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. After Daniel passed the test, not only was Daniel allowed 
to pray to God, to worship his God freely. It became an offense for anyone in that province to worship any other God. My God. If you choose the giver, you will be amazed what happens to you afterwards. Daniel was promoted. You know, he's, you know he was serving even across uh, 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 reigns with Cyrus. You know, it's amazing. With different kings, he was, he was still serving. Why? Because he chose the giver. Where is your loyalty? Is it with a gift or is it with a giver? Because of the decision, because of the devotion of one man, a whole nation, a whole empire, we're told if you don't serve God, you are breaking a law. And they all had to serve the God of Daniel. It's amazing. One man can make a difference. One person, one family can make a difference. God is looking to you. As you journey through that test, as you pass the test, God is going to use it to speak to many other lives. So where is your devotion? Maybe a whole generation is relying and depending on the decision you are making during your testing season. I dare say many of us are in testing season, particularly during this pandemic. It's a testing season for a lot of people. But God is going to say, where is your devotion? He already knows, but he wants you to know where your devotion and your loyalty lies. Praise the name of the Lord. And just one final word before we wrap up. John 6, 26 to 27. And I hope someone was, has been blessed by this. Despite all the interruptions, you know, God is faithful. God is awesome. Hallelujah. John 6, 26 to 27. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for meat which perisheth, for that meat which end, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. What are you laboring for? Where is your devotion? Where is your loyalty? God is going to put it to the test. He's going to find out. One of the things I said earlier, please don't give undue devotion to the gift because that's an automatic invitation to a test in that area. God is the ownership. God is the one that owns everything in our lives. Everything. Everything. Everything we have belongs to God. Don't have any undue devotion to anything. Everything belongs to God. Our money, our health, our children, our family, our spouse, our house, our cars. Well, just think of anything. Our business. Everything belongs to God. Abraham was put to the test. Daniel was put to the test. We don't want to be like these people in the text I just read. You know, the miracle happened. And you know what Jesus Christ said to them when they were looking, up, looking for him? He said, I know you are not looking for me. You are not looking for the miracles. Because the miracles will point to Christ. You are looking for the food I gave you. You know, there's a songwriter that says, look at his face and not his hand. Because if you are looking at his face, you are looking at God. But if you are looking at his hand... You're only looking out for what you can get from the deal, from him. Can I appeal to us? The people that are going to survive, that are going to thrive, that are going to excel, are the people whose focus is on the giver and not the gift. Please bow your heads and let's have a word of prayer. And your prayer is going to be this, Lord. Please help me to be totally devoted to you. Say, Lord, you have my affection, you have my devotion, my undivided attention. Just tell him, Lord, you have my attention, you have my devotion, my undivided loyalties to you. I thank you for the gift. Yes, 
I'm grateful for the gift. But Lord, I choose you, the giver. And have mercy upon me wherever my devotion has been upon the gift. From now on, was help me to be fully looking unto you. You know what the Bible says? It says, looking unto Jesus. Help me to look unto you, to be focused on you. And help me to mind what I say as I'm journeying through the test season. Abraham said, we will come back to you. He said to the young men, don't worry, we're going, we're going to come back. And the truth of the matter is this. If Abraham had killed Isaac, it is doubtful that he would have returned. He may have died on the mountain of grief. So when he said he will return, he wasn't just speaking about Isaac. He was speaking about himself. And we thank you, Lord, for reminding us of that. He said the Lord will provide. So God, help us to remember, oh God, that you will indeed provide and to watch what we say. I pray for everyone listening to me, oh God, that may be passing through a test right now, the grace to overcome and to be victorious. Father, grant us in Jesus' name. You already know the answer. Help us to pass. Help us to excel, that we will not disappoint you, that we will choose the giver and not just the gift. Our focus will be on the giver and not on the gift. Whilst we are grateful for the gift, Lord, we will choose you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen, amen. and amen.